Well, hello. Welcome to the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovation to Custom Homes. This week, this is our Q&A episode. So if you have any questions about renovations, um, home building, whatever, you can certainly hit us up and I will answer your question. We got a few that came in through our stories last couple of days, so I'll be happy to answer those. Um, yeah, so there's no guest today. It's just me talking about the stuff you've asked to know more about. And, um, and we'll see. Depends who's following the show. Maybe we'll bring some people on to chat about it. But for now, I think we'll, uh, we'll kind of stick to the program. Now, in theory, there is a way to show the questions, but I can see that my dashboard does not look like uh, it did in the, tu in the tutorial. So maybe I'll have to just read the questions out to you because I don't see the icon that they said was here. Oh, maybe I'll try this one. Look at that. There they are. I stand corrected. So we'll start off with um, a question we had about um, basements. Can you finish, can you partially finish a basement? And you certainly can. Um, but by doing that, there are some challenges that come with it. So we'll get into that question here. So for anyone just tuning in, Art of Renovation Live, this is the question and answer answer um, episode. And we'll talk a bit now about uh, whether it makes sense to partially finish a basement or not. So I'm just going to bring this question up here. All right. So Rad Tech. 227 wanted to know, can you partially finish a basement? And the answer is like, you certainly can partially finish a basement, but um, you really need to think about your big picture plan. Because if you only formulate the plan and the layout and go through the schematics of the space you're finishing now, and you don't consider what you may finish later and don't know how you're going to finish it later, that might result in you having to undo some of the work you've done now. I'll give you an example. So when you're doing your floor plan up for the space, and let's say for now in your basement, you only want to do, you know, a bedroom and a bathroom. And later you might develop, you know, an office. Uh, maybe you put in a wet bar. Maybe you'll have a theater area, whatever that might be. When you're doing your electrical rough in, you're going to want to know right now what circuits you need to pull to each of those other areas. Because if you go through and you finish off a space now that has the electrical panel tucked away in one corner and you're leaving the opposite end of the home unfinished, you might need to open walls up again at a later date to finish off that space. So that creates, um, you know, it can be frustrating for you to have to open things up and, and pull circuits. And we see that all the time on our projects where there's partially finished spaces or someone's changing the use of a space and we have to open up a bunch of walls and ceilings where uh, they didn't want to do additional work. So that can be frustrating. Same would apply for plumbing and HVAC consideration. So as far as how you're going to heat, maybe cool the space, your cold air returns. Um, if you're doing your bulkheads in your basement and you're, you know, only finishing one area and you don't factor in how you're going to actually distribute the heat and where it's going to all terminate, then you could run yourself into some trouble later when it comes time to finish it off. Um, by doing a partial basement development, it could get a little bit challenging with your permits and your inspections, depending on how you plan to do it. Generally, they want to come in, they want to give you a, you know, a rough in inspection, then a final um, or an occupancy, depending on how far you're going in that development. So permitting can get a little bit ugly if you have some unfinished areas that weren't inspected, then later you're trying to come back, have an inspector come back in later to do a rough in inspection on where you're tying off work that was completed previously, it could get a little bit um, challenging. I think another real issue to consider is if you're going to finish a space later as a stage two, always consider your finished products, maybe buy them now. So I'm referring to your flooring products, your tile, specifically the die lot. So if you go and decide to finish, you know, your portion of the floor now in whatever product you choose, LVP or carpet, whatever that might be, and you're going to finish the space, another half of the space later in a couple of years. Well, I can almost guarantee you when you go to order that floor product or whatever it is, um, it'll be from a different dye lot, which means the colors might not match up perfectly. And depending on how you plan to finish it, that could be a real challenge for you on the design side of things. And I guess lastly, um, it will cost more certainly to do it in multiple stages because you have additional mobilizations that are required and call out fees and logistical costs like deliveries and 
garbage disposal. We need another bin out there perhaps. So all those things will kind of add up to make the job cost a little bit more. But if you don't have the budget to do the whole space now and you need to break it up, that makes total sense. Just be aware of the fact maybe it's worth saving up for another year or so to be able to do the whole thing in one go if it's going to cost you less money, take less time and be ultimately less of a potential headache for you along the way. So there you go. Um, question number one. So if anybody else has any questions during the show, just shoot me a, you can add a comment or a question and I'll come back to them. Otherwise for now, I'm just going to stick to the ones that we, you know, we have, uh, in advance here and we'll answer those questions and then we'll, we'll take kind of, um, open questions here later as we go. Red tech says, that's what I suspected. Thanks for confirming one big rental with one big plan. Absolutely. And like the plan is key, right? Lay out, like have a great plan before you start and your contractor can help you with that. Um, your trade should be able to help. Depends on how you're approaching your pro your project, whether you're going to be the general contractor yourself, whether you're going to hire someone like me that does this type of work or whether you're going to um, ultimately do the work yourself, regardless of how you're going to approach it. If you don't have a good plan, a detailed plan, um, then you're setting yourself up for a struggle for sure. Okay. Next question. Bear with me here. Okay, so let's pull this up here. Okay, Lisa Renee 11 was asking about how to add support joist in the basement ceiling if you feel the floor gives as you walk on the floor upstairs. So um, if you're just tuning in, this is the Art of Renovation Live. This is the question and answer episode. And now we're talking about what to do to reinforce your floor if you feel movement there when you walk on it. So I think the first thing would be to confirm that it's actually your floor joist. Often when we feel, I call them spongy floors or bouncy floors, it could actually be just a poor job of a subfloor installed on top of the actual structural floor. And there could be bounce in there. We see it sometimes where you, especially if you have multiple layers of flooring stacked on top of each other, um, you can end up seeing um, a layer that didn't, that wasn't properly fastened to the one below it. And you get kind of an air pocket and it becomes bouncy and spongy. And that can give you the sensation of movement on your floor when it's not actually your structural floor moving, it's just the surface layers. So I would check that first because that's uh, generally a far less costly um, solution, depending what product you have down and whether you're planning to renovate or not, or you're just trying to fix this, you know, squishy, bouncy floor. Um, if it is actually your floor joists that are moving, then we have an issue and you might need to stabilize them. Um, some options there is you can sister material onto it. So basically you can attach additional joists and you can, you know, screw and glue them onto the existing joist to reinforce them and give more strength, right? You'll double up uh, the floor joists in that area. Um, sometimes some cross bracing might be sufficient. Um, really depends on your situation there. Um, I'll give you an example here. And this comes up more often now because we see this quite often becomes an issue when we put these large islands in kitchen jobs that we do. And most floor systems are not designed to take, you know, a 5,000 pound island, maybe not 5,000 pounds, but a very heavy island in the middle of your floor span, right? So give me a second here. I'm gonna pull up in a couple of pictures that show one that we did recently. The show that we did down in the basement. Do, do, do. Bear with me for a sec. All right, this is a kind of a terrible picture, but you can see here, uh, this shows the floor joist in the basement. That red line basically indicates where we're going to be adding uh, a beam and a couple of posts. So directly above that red line is a massive island with a big quartz countertop. And we can see upstairs in this home that there is a sag in the floor. So in this case, because of the way that this floor is framed, there is no other way really to reinforce the floor. So I'm just gonna show you, bear with me. Um, oh, sorry, they've done something different with the photo um, feature here. Oh boy, I love learning live on the show. This is always good fun for me. Okay, I'll try this button, stop sharing, there we go. 
that's how it works. Okay, so to, to be able to put in uh, the beam and the posts I needed, we had to cut open their concrete floor slab in the basement and form a new footing to be able to support the point load transferred from the beam down to this post. So, um, so that's a, it's a fairly big process to do it. It's not terribly expensive, but if you had a finished basement, this is a real challenge because now we have to pull apart um, some aspects of the basement to be able to do that. And at the end of this project, um, I'll show you what we had here. So my face is kind of covering part of this up, but you can see now there's a new uh, LVL beam across. We have it um, mounted to the foundation wall below, and now we have a telepost um, with a new footing below it there. So that would be how you would support the floor by putting a beam and post below. Now that might not work for all applications, if you're lucky, it's not actually your structural floor. Maybe it's just um, a poorly installed subfloor. Um, maybe just some cross bracing, bracing might be sufficient or maybe sistering on some additional material. So there you go. Lisa Renee, I hope that um, helped answer your question. If you're not too sure what the cause is, um, reach out. We can always send a carpenter by, take a look at it for you and uh, identify what the problem actually is and then figure out a game plan. But um, you know, it becomes way more challenging if we're in a fully finished home, right? If you're in a basement where the floor, the floor joists are visible from downstairs, it becomes a lot easier for us to troubleshoot. Um, but if it's a drywalled ceiling down there, it will be uh, a challenge because we'll have to open up the ceiling and that obviously then results in you having to do some renovations downstairs, maybe you weren't planning, so. Okay, moving right along. What do we have for our next question here? Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. grout on a ceramic floor. Okay, we had a question from LTI123. The grout on our floor tile, which is ceramic porcelain, uh, is cracking and crumbling. How to fix and cost? All right, well, if you're just tuning in, this is the Art Renovation Live. This is our question and answer, answer episode. And we're just talking now about cracking grout in floor tile, what to do about it. So. Firstly, I would say that usually when we see cracking grout in your in any tile assembly, it's usually one of two things. Either they didn't mix the grout properly, so it was either too dry or too wet when it went in, it wasn't properly troweled in, so it didn't really penetrate all the way into the joint or in, and uh, give you good coverage, which is kind of an easy mistake to make if you're new, if you're not an experienced tile setter and you're trying the job at home and you mix your grout and you don't get the, you know, the right ratio of water to your grout mix, then you can end up with something that's not going to really hold up, it will be very strong. So that's certainly an option or a reason why it could crack, but most often we find that um, it's the substrate wasn't properly done. So basically your, your tile was installed over top of a surface that wasn't thick enough or rigid enough and there's a bit of movement now in the floor and because of that movement you see the grout begin to crack. So if that's what's happening, you've got a bigger problem, right? If, if it's just a bad grout mix, pardon me, and you have to re-grout, it's time consuming, it's annoying, it's dirty, but you can do it. You gotta scrape out all the grout and from there, you get a new batch and you, you go from there. And, you know, it can be done. We've had to do it before when we had a mistake on a site and we got to replace the grout because of the wrong color. And it's very frustrating, but it's totally doable. And at the end, it can still look like, like mint again, right? But if you're in this situation where you've got um, movement underneath your floor tile, um, you got a bigger problem now. So I guess one Hail Mary pass I can throw you would be if you scraped out all your grout and you put in an epoxy-based grout, these grout products are more flexible. They can sometimes take that, that can have the tolerance for a bit of movement. That might be a solution for you until your tile starts popping off your floor, right? So but it's not really good news for you and you can try that, but typically if your grout's, if your grout's failing, um, usually it's because there's movement in the floor or the wall or whatever it might be, right? So that's a bigger problem. And I'll show you a couple of pictures here of like what you should have realistically on your floor. So not everyone does, not everyone use the uncoupling membrane or the, the DITRA product, anti-fracture it can be called, but um, it's a great product to use. 
it's becoming more affordable. It's becoming very common practice. I would consider it a best practice. And this product, so this is the orange stuff shown here. So um, that we get installed over top of your subfloor. Um, you know, it's on top of a bed of mortar and then you install it, then you, then you again tile on top of that again. And these can come with um, grooves to take heat trace in there as well, which is a nice option, especially in a bathroom or a kitchen. But um, anyways, so this little membrane will, um, will could save you. And also, like if you're gonna install tile on just wooden subfloors, you need about an inch and an eighth total thickness to get what's considered a, a solid enough substrate to install your tile on. And sometimes that inch and an eighth, you know, if you have that tile floor beside an LVP floor, well, you need way more subfloor to, accom to accommodate or to reach, sorry, that uh, total subfloor thickness that you need, then you can kind of get stuck with a difference in heights between your floors. And that's kind of where the, the uh, anti-fracture membranes come in and they're, they're thinner. It still gives you that, um, strength that you need to avoid tiles popping out and uh you know it's a it's a good solution but it costs more right but like most things if you want to do it properly you know um it's going to cost you a bit more but i guarantee you it'll cost you less in the long run right up front the cost is higher but you'll eliminate the need to deal with warranty calls or re early replacement um, things of that nature so and those can be very very frustrating for everybody so my advice is always just do it properly um, right off the get-go. Um, I think it makes the whole process better for everybody. Um, just a matter of knowing what you're getting up front so that, because tile, tile is one of those things, we talked about this last week on the show, you know, most tile jobs look fantastic when they're done, unless somebody wasn't a talented installer, but most guys, and, and even some talented guys, right, who know how to lay tile and, and you know, it's nice and flat, plumb, the grout lines are nice and consistent. Um, if they didn't prep their surface properly, you won't know there's been a mistake made till later when it begins to fail. Whether that means there's water getting behind the tile, you have a rot issue now or mold, um, or whether the tile starts failing, right? And so it's one of those things where make sure you're very careful about who you select to do your tile work. So that's my long-winded answer for you there, uh, L Tai. I hope uh, I hope that helps. Um, you ask for pricing, really hard to give a number until you know what the product or the problem is. So again, I would say if you're not too sure, I know some great people in the tile world or one of my carpenters come, come take a look to confirm what the issue is. Um, but on your end, you know, you could start with um, a couple quick things to test it, I suppose. It's a little bit risky though, but you know, you could um, drop something solid on your tile, not heavy, don't drop a hammer on it necessarily, but if it sounds hollow, um, that's a problem, uh, which means it's not really properly secured to the substrate. Um, or if you can see, if you, you know, jump around on your floor a bit, if you can see some movement, then you'll know that's, that's an issue. But hopefully for you, it's just a bad grout job and maybe you can replace it, but um, that's a little bit less likely in my opinion. Anyhow, thank you for the question. All right, we got uh, Liz Sierra flooring saying correct poorly installed subfloor can cause major issues. Absolutely, definitely can. Okay, moving right along. What's our next question? Mm -mm -mm. Okay, from Sunder Woodworks, when retrofitting an old house to increase energy efficiency, what to do first? That's a good question. That's a big question. Okay, so if you're just tuning in, this is the Art Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovation and the Custom Homes. And today, this is our question and answer episode. So we're taking um, answers in from, from our guests, I suppose, um, from our followers, and addressing them here on the show today. And our current question is about when retrofitting an old house, um, what to do first as far as increasing energy efficiency. So. Step one, and I got an image for you here, Sunder Woodworks. And I'm sure you probably already know this, but do, do, do. All right. In my opinion, this would be step one. It's called a blower door test. So what they do here is basically they seal off the door. They put a fan on there. They have a pressure sensor installed. And what they're doing is they're checking to see how airtight your home is. And through this process, they'll be able to identify kind of the weak links in the home, right? So um, 
usually windows and doors are you know kind of the first place you look but also in older homes vapor barrier um, can be non-existent uh, you could have penetrations that were cut in during various renovations over the years um, there can be some times where assemblies aren't properly um, attached anymore and you end up with just a, a, kind of a leaky home as far as air quality goes so I want you to start with that and then from there you get a report that shows the areas you need to go to first as far as what you're going to address um, I think it also really depends also what you're planning to do within this renovation how far are you going are you gutting this house right back to studs if you are well then you have certainly a different set of options available to you as far as how you're going to address making this home more energy efficient. Um, it also depends on the age of the home, right? If you're in a centennial home, well, construction practices were very different back then compared to how they were in the 50s. Um, and then, you know, a drastic change between the 50s and the 80s again. So your existing insulation, uh, I'll call it a system. Um, you know, if it's that old, if it's wood chip in your walls, well, for sure they've all settled. So, you know, that's a pretty tough one to resolve properly. Also, you won't have really an effective vapor barrier. A vapor barrier, you know, it, it um, is probably more important than insulation itself as far as creating an airtight home that's efficient. Um, you can have a really well insulated home, but if it has a whole bunch of air leaks, then you know, you're gonna be just paying to heat more of that space because uh, the heat will escape, right? Or cold air will come in. So, you know, I think it really depends on how far you, you plan to go. If you're not planning to gut the home, but you wanna make it better, then, you know, the easy starting point becomes your doors and windows, right? Um, checking all those penetrations in your home to make sure that they're all sealed properly. So that would be everything from your dryer vent to your furnace intake and exhaust to your, um, you know, your hose bibs, like all this stuff that would penetrate through a wall. You want to check those things out and make sure that um, they're well sealed. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so your attic, are you planning to reinsulate the attic or not? So that's another great way to address both vapor barrier and insulation at the same time. You can then put proper um, insulation stops in. Um, if you don't have a vented soffit, you can address that too. And things have changed so much within how we build houses now that, um, you know, it's really important that uh, you do your best to, with the home that you have too, right? There'll be limitations on some homes. So it'll depend on your roof slope, on your heel height, all these different things might not let you uh, retrofit a more current system in place. And you might need to just maximize the efficiency of what you have for the area of your area, the era of your home. So that becomes another consideration too is what age is your home how far down the rabbit hole of a reno are you going to go and then um you know uh, what are the limitations of the age of your home without doing a major reno to it so you know more directly like vapor barrier is key as i mentioned before um insulation so if you're not planning to tear all the drywall or plaster off your walls and re-insulate you can put some products on the exterior of the home I'll show you a bit about what that looks like here so there's different ways you can approach it and you know in this case, um, we have um, some new insulation going over top of this product. Oh, wait, which one is this here? Hold on, wrong photo, sorry. Mm -mm. Anyways, there's lots of different systems you can use for exterior insulation. Um, there's rigid foam, there's rock wool, there's, there's a whole bunch of new systems now that you can you can invest in. And it can save you a bunch of money as far as needing to gut the whole interior. Um, can't find the photo I was thinking of here. Sorry about that. In any case, so that's one way to do it inside, insulate from the inside or from the out, from the outside. Um, spray foam, spray foam is pretty fantastic as far as it being an insulation and a vapor barrier combined in one product. So it will seal things up really well. Um, so I would say in older homes, it's nice to retrofit that product in where we can because it'll really help to seal things up. Uh, acoustic sealant, that's part of the vapor barrier assembly. Most older homes don't have that. So you'll see now, um, wherever you have vapor barrier, you'll see kind of this gooey caulking, silica caulking product. And that just is to create a, a nice seal um, within the vapor barrier assembly itself. Mm -hmm. I've got a question here. I'll get back to it in a second there, Kelsey. Um, 
windows and doors, that's an, an obvious one. So within your window systems, you can get dual pane, tri pane. Um, you know, it depends what kind of product you pick as well. If you go with the slider window, um, that's less has a less reliable seal than say a casement or awning window because in the slider window you're you're sliding along the seal whereas in the casement or an awning you're pushing up on the seal which helps to uh, create a better, better, better seal right so different products like that so I know Sunder Woodworks that's a pretty long rambly answer to your question um, it's not that straightforward but um, if you have something specific in mind I'm happy to talk to you about it maybe you can give me a call at the office I can set you up with the people you need to, to start off if you have a specific home that you're you're working on here. So thank you for your question. Okay, let's check here. All right. What do we have for questions here? Mm -hmm. Okay, Kelsey FM, she just asked, um, inexpensive renovations to boost condo value. Well, that kind of actually segues nicely into one of the other questions we had that came in, um, not through the through the app, but um, so like what renovations improve a home's resale? So within a home and a condo, I think they'll be very similar. So uh, if you're just tuning in, this is the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovations and Custom Homes. This is our question and answer episode. And Kelsey FM asked, um, you know, what are some inexpensive renovations to boost condo value? So I'll address that as well as generally what renovations will increase value in your in your home or condo. So historically speaking, your kitchen, your bathrooms, those are the real bang for your buck, dollar for dollar returns, um, depending on how you do them, of course. So I guess to be more specific to your question, Kelsey, so inexpensive renovations. So that's kind of an interesting term, like because expensive is fairly subjective, right? So I guess what can be expensive is doing a poor job or picking bad products or having an amateur do the work. That can cost less upfront, but I think it can backfire in the long run. So if you have an amateur come and do a kitchen rental for you to prep your property for sale and it looks like an amateur job, I don't think that's gonna help attract many buyers. In fact, it might just have been a waste of time and money to do the work at all. Um, Rad Tech's asking a fireplace. Um, a fireplace can bring some value in, I think, for the right person. Depends how you approach it, right? So a gas fireplace is a lot more money to install um, as a new application. If you haven't had one there before, you need a, you know, you need a chimney chase, you need a chimney, you need a gas line, you need some power. Um, that's a, you'd probably, if you're going in from scratch on a gas fireplace, you're probably sitting somewhere in that you know, five to $10,000 range, it, unless you're going really fancy on your mantle, things like that. If you go with electric fireplace, um, you know, that's a nice, creates a nice ambiance in the room. It's a nice detail, doesn't really add any sort of heat value. It's not gonna warm up your space, but it looks pretty slick. Um, you know, you can do electric fireplaces for, for quite a bit less. There's no venting needed. You don't need a gas line. You just need an electrical circuit. Um, some plug into the wall on an existing circuit. And then it's a matter of how far do you want to go as far as making it look pretty, right? So electric fireplaces, you can probably do from one to five grand. Again, unless you're going into something where you're getting very creative about how you do the mantle and how you finish the surface of the fireplace chase. So, But in general, I would say, you know, inexpensive renovations, you know, typically, you know, I think you need to assess the overall condition of the space. If it's looking really run down and you think a coat of paint would help freshen it up, that's fantastic, but if your floor, your floors are totally beat, well, maybe it's not even worth putting the, the coat of paint in, right? Maybe you're gonna sell it as is, I'm not too sure, right? Depends on the space, right? But if it all looks pretty good and a coat of paint would help a lot, maybe you have a dated color there and you can modernize it somewhat or freshen it up with another coat of paint on there, that can be a very inexpensive way to make the space look really, uh, maybe not new, but kind of fresh again. Um, flooring changes too, those can make a big difference depending on what product you have in your home existing. I would say as far as like renovations in general go, you know, like I said before, the kitchen and bathroom is kind of the way to go, but you need to do it properly, right? And somewhere in the middle, you don't want to go overboard and do some super fancy high-end kitchen because um, that might not yield a good return when you come to sell the home, right? And definitely don't start picking 
super trendy and really polarizing colors and fixtures in there because um, that could actually really date, uh, date stamp the project in some way. And if someone doesn't like a current trend and you've gone and followed that, that makes it a bit harder to sell. So I like a timeless look within what we do. Um, but that being said, you know, our clients are always kind of in control and work with our designers to make sure we come up with something that, um, that meets their needs. So Kelsey, I would say that, you know, quickly, I would say flooring paint makes a big difference. In your kitchen, if it's all relatively in good condition, um, you know, classing up the space a little bit can help sometimes. So it could be as simple as changing hardware in your cabinets, it could be adding backsplash tile. Um, you know, if your door profile is is nice, but the color is a bit dated, we see lots of kind of this um, peachy oak color that came out of the 80s and 90s. Those, a nice coat of paint on your cabinets can make a big difference. Um, but overall, I would say that, um, you know, your best bang for your buck is your kitchen or your bathroom, Re renovating them to something that would be more appealing and more modern. And, and nowadays, the designs that we have and the products, they all work a lot better and uh, far more functional. Okay, so I hope that helps a little bit, Kelsey. Um, mm -mm -mm. That's it for, I think, posted questions here. Okay. So we've got a couple other ones that I'll get to. 130. So we've got some time for sure. So anybody has any questions, fire away. I got a couple more here I'd plan to talk about. And um, then from there we'll kind of uh, see what questions are out there and, and take it from there. So one of the questions we have is what's a realistic budget for a kitchen renovation? Okay, so if you're just tuning in, I'm Paul from Contact Renovation to Custom Homes. This is the Art of Renovation Live, our question and answer episode. And now we're talking about what is a realistic budget for your kitchen renovation. So our average kitchens that we do are probably somewhere between that sixty to $70,000 price range. Those are our average kitchens. And we'll do you know a handful of kitchens a year that are over 100000 bucks, And we'll do a handful a year that are down in that forty dollars to $50,000 range. And some can be less, depends on, on the home. But typically speaking, it'll really depend on a few key factors. Is are you reconfiguring the kitchen? Are you taking out any walls or any of them bearing? Are we having to do uh, extensive removal of drywall and maybe ceilings to accommodate the new lighting layouts associated with it? And then, you know, ultimately your biggest single cost in the kitchen will be your cabinets. And you can see Katrina Bella just commented four sacks of cash. So I don't know how many, how much cash is in each sack, but, um, but you're right, Rebecca, absolutely. The kitchen cabinets can be the most expensive part and it depends what you pick, right? On the low end, you can go with a prefab product or an Ikea product, or you can get into um, your custom kitchen uh, cabinets. And I'm, I, I always prefer to put in a custom cabinet because ultimately um, you're going to get then the kitchen that you really want, right? We can design cabinets that are going to fit specifically into the space that you have and won't get stuck with uh, nearly as many little filler panels or voids as you might when you're stuck using a, a prefabricated product that only comes in certain sizes. So um, you know, so as far as like a good kitchen budget, and it depends on who you're hiring to do the job too. Like, look, like my company, Contact Renovations, I have some serious overhead. I've got a shop space here. I got a bunch of trucks, I have a bunch of employees. And as a result, that impacts what I need to charge as a contractor, right? And we also adhere to best practice. So we do things in a way that we feel is the best possible way to do it. And we don't cut corners. Um, but as a result, that res creates a cost within the construction cost of your project overall, right? So if you have someone with very low overhead who can do a job for you and you trust them, then that's that's great, right? Will they be there in the long term to be able to service that product for you and honor warranties, all that kind of stuff? That's really a different conversation for you to have with your contractor. So, you know, for us, we think a budget between sixty to $70,000 gets you into a, uh, into a really nice kitchen. And what we consider kind of standard on our end is is already upgraded, right? So one thing to consider is, you know, like let's talk about your plumbing fixtures, for example, in your kitchen. So in our standard 
jobs and we're putting together pricing, what we call a rough estimate for a potential kitchen project, I'll use $850 for your allowance for your kitchen sink and I'll use 650 bucks for your kitchen faucet. Those are nice, handsome allowances. So when you go to the showroom eventually to go pick your sink, you'll have plenty of choices, right? If you wanna pick one that's $300, you know you're now saving money and you're reducing your total project cost. But if you opt for the granite sink that's 1500 bucks and your allowance was 850, you know now you're raising your project cost. But um, same with your faucet, right? So we build our projects with nice, handsome allowances so that you have plenty of options at the showroom once you get into design and selections, right? So when I say our kitchen budgets are 60 to 70K, that's based on really nice allowances. You've got quartz granite countertops, you have standard under cabinet lighting, coming with backsplash tile. We're expecting to do an LED pot lighting grid in the kitchen. We're expecting to have pendant lighting if there's an island. Um, we're expecting to make sure that all your uh, plumbing, electrical, and HVAC is co-compliant. So that's what you get within the price range that we discuss. And this kind of all goes hand in hand, I think, with you know the, my, my, the next question that we had, which is, why is there such a variation in price between the quotes you get on your project, right? And a big part of that is how, that, how people build an estimate and how much you know up front to be able to specify what you want exactly. So when you're asking about a kitchen budget, well, I have some questions for you first because I don't know really, you know, me saying 60 to 70,000, that's just based on our historical data for the jobs that we've done, right? And we generally service a client who wants something that's very nice, that they like how we adhere to best practice and they're adding in there some bells and whistles and some nice little options to really class up the space, right? We don't generally come in and try to do, you know, cheapest possible option, you know, just base model type of stuff. We tend to stay away from that because that's not what makes um, us excited, right? And so anyway, so if you're planning a kitchen reno and you're asking what the range is, you need to understand, well, what's your scope of work first? So um, is the layout changing? Are there any walls being removed? Are you reconfiguring any windows to accommodate your new layout? Um, are we having to replace the ceiling? And is there asbestos abatement required? You know, if you're in a house from the 50s, 60s, 70s, you might have a problem with asbestos if we have to go and modify walls. Um, you know, uh, what cabinet spec do you want, right? Ikea prefab or custom, but even within say the custom range, you can decide, do you want a thermofoil door? Do you want an MDF painted door? Do you want a solid wood stained grade door? Um, and then even within how the cabinets are built, there's so many different options. You know, if it's a bunch of cupboard doors, that's one price. If you have a ton of pullouts and drawers, then that's gonna raise the construction cost, right? So um, are you doing extensive lighting layout changes within the area? And ultimately, what are you selecting for your finishes as far as your countertop, you know, your backsplash tile, all those different selections you have are gonna dictate the price to some extent. And even within a quartz countertop, you can get them at $86 a square foot installed. You can get them at $350 a square foot or higher installed. So it depends on what you pick for your product ultimately. So, um, you know, it's really difficult to say what your kitchen's gonna cost unless you have a very clear scope and spec. But I think um, realistically, sixty to seventy thousand dollars would give you a really nice kitchen, one that you're going to be excited to uh, work in, spend time in, show off to your friends and family, and one you're going to love for a long time. That's going to be high quality uh, products that will hold up to the wear and tear of um, being at home and and cooking, and hopefully sometime soon hosting dinner parties and all those fun things again. So, anyhow, thanks for that question. For anybody who's just tuning in. Uh, this is The Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster from Contact Renovations and Custom Homes. This is our question and answer episode. So I'm answering a bunch of questions that came in. And um, moving on is going to be the question of the day. And this one kind of ruffles my feathers a little bit. And it's all about why is there such a variation between the quotes I receive for your project? So look, I just alluded to this in the last segment. Um, you need to know what your scope and your specifications are because if you don't have those clearly outlined and to provide to your contractors who you plan to have price your project, then you're leaving it up to the contractor to make a whole bunch of assumptions on your behalf. And not every contractor is equal or approaches it in the same way, right? So um, 
let's talk about me because this is what I know best. So the way that I price things here at Contact is I give you what I think is a realistic price up front. Okay, so if you know you want, let's say it's kitchen, we're talking about kitchens, right? You wanna do a kitchen reno, like I said before, I'm gonna give you a really solid allowance for your sink, for your faucet, for your countertops, for your cabinets, for everything. And I'll base it on historically what we know has been required in projects that are similar to your project. And, um, you know, based on what we've seen so far within whether we've been to a site visit or we've done a video call or looking at photos, we'll build a, what we think is a realistic price that um, is actually deliverable. One thing that I see out there in the marketplace a lot, which is very frustrating for me, is a very different angle, which is give somebody the most attractive price you can up front just to get them in the door and then drive the price up later. And that's not a game that um, I play and I don't want to be involved in that because it's a very frustrating process if it is. Um, you know, we try to price things in a way that ultimately um, when it goes from rough estimating to the, the design agreement, that you can hold the line on your price, that every choice you make will not be an upgrade. So within the example I gave for your kitchen sink, if I give you 850 for your sink allowance, when you go to the showroom, there's lots of choices. So you can probably find one for 850 or less. But if I gave you, if I based your whole estimate on allowances that were say 350 for your kitchen sink and $300 for your kitchen faucet, when you go to the showroom, you're gonna have very few options and everything's gonna become an upgrade. And basically what's gonna happen is your project price is gonna grow and grow and grow, right? So it kind of comes down to ultimately you being as clear as you can up front with the contractors who are pricing your projects. What is your scope? What is the spec, right? Ideally you have all that confirmed and it goes out to tender and everyone can quote on, on an apples to apples comparison for you and there you go. You know exactly what you're looking at. But when you're just saying, oh, I want a kitchen rental, I don't really know what I want. I don't think I want quartz or granite countertops. I don't really want Ikea. I like a custom cabinet. Um, yeah, backsplash sounds nice. And sure, why not under cabinet lighting? Well, there's a ton of variables within those four things alone, right? And if somebody's taking the angle of trying to make your quote look really attractive because they just want to try and get you to hook on, then they can pick a whole bunch of low end stuff and make the number look fantastic. And on the other end, if you get a guy like me out there who's going, look, I'm gonna give you a really good allowances to give you a realistic price that you can lean on and that you'll have lots of choices, then you're gonna look at that, those two estimates and one's gonna be probably $10,000 lower than the other one, right? And it's really hard for people to turn away from that $10,000 difference and I recognize that, right? But I think that in the long run, and I see it all the time, you know, hearing from clients that, oh my goodness, we wish we'd just gone with you. In the end, it costs the same as you said, or maybe even more, but it was a huge headache getting there. And for me, that's like very disheartening to hear that because ultimately, you know, I just want to come up front and be real about the numbers and, and uh, not play any games about it all. So anyhow, there you go. There's kind of why you'll see variations in the quotes. I know it's a long-winded answer, but it's something that um, I have to think about every day looking at how we prepare our rough estimates and our proposals and you know we just choose to do it in a way that's that's very direct and very realistic and you know our clients I think really appreciate that but I also see how some people get sucked into going for these low quotes um, just to find out later actually that's not the real price so good luck to you all I would say is like do your research and try to prepare in advance as much information as you can about your project so that your contractors can provide estimates or quotes that are, you know, that are equal in spec, right? Okay, so thanks for that question. Um, let's see here if we have any other questions that have come in. I don't think I saw any come through here. Oh, there's a couple in here. Um, mm -mm -mm. El Tai wants to know about the cost to replace shingles or a roof on a 2,300 square foot two-story house with garage attached. All right, I can't really tell you that because I don't really know offhand. Um, we don't do the roofing in-house and I would need to look at the house and see what the roof lines look like. Um, you know, the pitch, all that kind of stuff factors into the price, what type of shingle you're going to need. 
Um, maybe I would say El Tai, you want to shoot me a message with your address, I can look the house up on Google really fast and probably give you a better idea um, at that time. We got El Tai again asking, can scratches on full wood vinyl planks on the floor be repaired or need to be removed or replaced? Depends on the scratch and on the color of your of your wood product or your full wood product. It's probably a laminate you're talking about or maybe a luxury vinyl. So they certainly can be repaired. It just depends on the pattern and the color, right? So if it's a one solid color, that's a lot easier to patch. Well, depending on the color itself, I suppose. If you've got quite a variation in grain within this full product, then you need someone who can be very creative with their touch up pens as far as making that look nice. So. I think it would depend on the extent of the scratching, how deep it is, and how much you have across the entire floor. Um, if the whole thing is scratched up from, say, a large dog or pets or whatever it might be, I think that's a losing battle. If you have a couple spots with some major scratches, I think those could probably be repaired. Um, and if they're really bad, then there's kind of some tricks of the trade to get you know, a couple planks out here and there without them take the whole floor out to do it. So. Um, let's see here. That's all I got for questions here. I'm gonna just kind of, I got some pictures that I pulled out for the show and I'll just pull them out to talk to you a bit about them. So, um, oh, I can see some of these were pertaining to previous questions in the show, but let's talk about kitchen for a second. So we're talking about your kitchen. So this kitchen here that we did is in a penthouse condo downtown. Um, it's, not a 60 to $70,000 kitchen. This one was quite a bit more money. So, but I wanna show you something within this one that why it costs more money. And sometimes it's worth every penny, depends on you as the client. So on the right hand side of this image, you can see this pantry wall and looks really slick. We got a two-tone kitchen going there. But one thing we incorporated here is all these little pullouts. So this would ultimately, you know, these ones here specifically added about a thousand dollars per pullout to the cost of the kitchen. And these are beautiful units. They're all soft clothes, um, super high efficiency as far as storage space goes and accessibility of the things you have in storage. So um, definitely, uh, this is one of my favorite features in a kitchen is the pullout. I think in fact, I might have a little video here I can share with on this one. I don't know how it's gonna work on this live format, but let's see what happens when I hit it. There you go, there's me. All right, so these are sick. They're soft clothes. Um, you know, they're really nice unit. Really maximizes your storage and you know, they look, they look really great too, right? So there you go. That's one way, right? And th those kind of things, they will drive your project cost up, but um, ultimately um, really functional, nice way to do it. Here's another example in a kitchen. So this is some under cabinet lighting uh, with a nice, we had a custom metal backsplash tile we had, uh, we brought in from overseas. And one difference in this one is you notice there's no penetrations in the backsplash. So, what I mean by that is there's no receptacles in the backsplash. You can see they're all installed on the underside of the cabinet in this one. And I know that generally I'll tell you that uh, most inspectors don't like this. Um, and in some cases they won't pass inspection on this, but we happened to talk to the, you know, the big cheese at the time and he okayed this one for us. And that was really great for the client because we got to showcase this backsplash tile and, um, yeah, and it looks really great. So again, different ways you can approach it. Some things will cost more than others. Just depends on what you want for the finished product, right? I believe it's worth the extra bit to make something stand out as remarkable, but ultimately everybody has a budget that we try to stick within. So, um, you know, back to the pricing side of things, if you have a project in mind, we always ask what your budget is so we can ultimately kind of reverse engineer a project for you that fits within uh, your budget. Here's another example in a kitchen we did recently of some floating shelves, right? And we took it to the next level by adding some lighting within those floating shelves. And we also did a really nice decorative tile inlay on the wall around those shelves to help further border them, frame them and showcase them. So, you know, that's just some examples of, you know, what we like to do 
And maybe this then helps to understand why our averages on our kitchens maybe um, are higher than some other contractors because we do it in a bit of a different way where um, we want you to be super proud of it and, uh, and love showing it off. Let's see here. What else can I show you? I got about 10 minutes left. Let's see if anything interesting to show you that's noteworthy. Um, here, let's talk about this is inside of a shower in a master bedroom. So diff different ways you can approach storage within your shower, right? You can put some glass shelves that are mounted on the wall. You could um, get a freestanding unit that kind of is in a compression rod that goes from floor to ceiling. You could have tiled shelves that are mounted in the corners. Um, in this case, we put these linear niches in and we put um, glass shelves within the recessed niche. Um, Nice little design touch. We use the black Schluter edge around that to tie in with the black frame or hardware on the sh on the shower glass and on the plumbing fixtures. So there's different ways you can approach it. Um, you know, we like to try and approach it in a way that you know functions really well and, and looks really, really slick, right? Um, mm, L tie. I see you've asked a question again about the grout. I actually talked about your question earlier in the show. Um, so we're gonna, we'll cut this show up into little segments later so maybe you can rewatch that section, but um, take a look at that. Anyway, so this bathroom here, when we finished recently again, you have so many options within a bathroom now and how you're gonna finish it. Um, what kind of door system do you want? This one's got a sliding door system. Um, you can go frameless, you can go framed. Um, this one's got a niche. Uh, we got a bench on this one as well, which then results in the need for some custom glass because it notches around it. Uh, this one had an adjacent walk-through walk-in closet, uh, which we finished with IKEA cabinets within their, their pack system, but we customized them. So kind of get a better bang for your buck on those um, on the finishing there because you're using a less expensive product, but then we can customize it in some cases. So just a couple examples too there as well. Okay, well, we're getting close to the end of the show here. We've got about eight minutes left. So if you have any questions for me about questions about renovations in general or anything for that matter, uh, fire away. I'm happy to answer them for you. I uh, don't have any other prepared content for you, so I was going to keep looking through some pictures and talk, telling you about them unless you have some questions. All right. Let's see here. Talking about basements earlier and... Um, Rad Tech asked a bit about, you know, should you partially or you recommend partially finishing a basement? And my advice was sure, as long as you have the total project plan uh, prepared. So this particular shot is an image of an under the stair little bar we built for a client. And within this one, um, you know, you needed a water line, you needed power, you needed dedicated circuits for the fridges. So those types of things you would need to know in advance. If you're not finishing this section of your basement at the same time as another, you want to know this so you have everything laid out in advance to avoid the need to rebuild um, any areas within the basement when you go to do your second stage. Um, actually, I'll show you this other one first. So here's kind of a before and after of a, a window that does not meet egress in a basement. And then we put a bedroom downstairs and I'll show you what we had to do to make this egress compliant. We took it from that little slider window and we converted it to this. So within that, we've got a foundation cut. We have excavation. We had to tie this into the weeping tile. Um, and those are changes. This is before the parging was done. So it looks way nicer, I assure you. Um, but it's a big, a big change. It made a, it was a real deal or game changer downstairs because they had so much more natural light come into the bedroom. Now they had an egress compliant window, so they had means of escape in the case of a fire. Because that other window that was there previously, there was no way you could get out of that thing. So, kind of another example of um, what it takes to make things co-compliant at times, and and there's a really good benefit that comes with it most of the time. And here's an example of a basement that we did where he had planned to do um, to finish the fireplace later. So we framed the fireplace chase, we put the mantle in, we have electrical roughed in for his TV. We've got a gas line roughed in within the fireplace chase. 
and we had framed an opening to accept a fireplace, but um, he didn't have the budget at the time to to buy the unit and and install it. So, you know, again, you can plan things in stages, but you need to have well, you need to have a good plan and have all your spec confirmed in advance so that when it comes time to do it, you have as little rework to do as possible. Okay. Well, I think I'm getting close to the end of what I've got to share with you here. Bear with me. Looking for some interesting photos here. Yeah. Options again, under cabinet lighting. Here's an example of uh, standard under cabinet lighting on the lower cabinets and then we have upper cabinet lighting where we went RGBK, which means you could do multiple colors. Um, upgrade wise, you're adding a few hundred dollars to the cost, but it's a really nice feature. You can kind of change the um, the feel of your room based on whatever the occasion might be, right? Um, pick a color and you can actually program these things to um, kind of flash or fluctuate in color along with the beat of your music. It's really, it's really cool, lots of options. Kind of gimmicky stuff too, depends on how you plan to use it. If your kitchen's a nightclub, I guess it's a different story, but um, there you go. Anyhow, I'll shout out last call for questions. You're welcome, Rad Tech. Thanks for tuning in. Um, yeah, so we'll be back in, I think, three weeks because I'm away next week for spring break and uh, we'll get back into it. We're gonna start talking about exteriors, more to do with landscaping and decks and pergolas, things like that, because it's the time of year now that uh, we're all thinking about going outside and enjoying our yards. So we'll be back um, soon with some uh, content about exterior renovations, landscaping, deck and pergola building. We actually have a few projects just like that that are starting up right away. So I can probably show you some, uh, some good live or very current content while we're doing that so yeah so i guess ultimately if you have any questions about a renovation you're not too sure where to start you can give me a call I'm happy to chat with you reach out to our office we can set up a time for a phone call if you have a bigger project in mind you need a hand looking for a contractor to help you with that too uh, whatever it is i'm happy to share what i know i love what i do and uh, I'd like to help you avoid those landmines that exist out there in the renovation world. So um, thanks for tuning in. This has been the Art of Renovation Live. I'm your host, Paul Foster, Contact Renovation to Custom Homes. I will see you again in a few weeks. Take care.